joined us this morning. I'm here to do tithes and offering. If you're in the house and you need an offering envelope from the ushers, they're in the aisles. Just lift your hands and they can help you. If you're online with us, then you can join us by giving through e-transfer or Tithely app or CanadaHelps.org that you'll find on our website. I want to read you two scriptures from the book of Proverbs which is the book of wisdom, amen. It says in Proverbs 22, verse 9, a generous man will himself be blessed. And in Proverbs eleven twenty five, it says, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So we have to remember that our God is not a God of lack. He's not a God of poverty, but he's a God of blessings, amen. That's why he promised the blessings to Abraham all the way in the Old Testament. So it's a big part of God's agenda to invest in us freely. He invests in us joy. He invests in us love, the love that we sang about this morning, and all those attributes of the fruits of the Spirit that we have. So when you're giving your tithes today, consider it as an investment, <clears throat> that you're giving it into the ministry that you believe in, in this case, Bible, Faith, Family of Churches, the one that you believe in and that you're connected with. So you invite God to give of abundance and to keep his generous promises to you. Amen? Let's pray. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be able to give, Father. And as we give, you're able to bless our lives in the different areas that we need. Give us more love. Give us more joy. Give us more happiness, Father. Forgive us better jobs. Whatever we're lacking, Father, because you're the God of abundance, you're able to bless us because we're obedient to allow you into our lives by giving our tithes and offerings. We thank you that as we give it with a generous heart, you're able to use this, Father, to spread your gospel over the city, over the country, and over the nations of this world. Father, so we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah! My, 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 we're still rocking, <laughs> we're still rocking in the house. We want to welcome you for wherever you are, whether you're in Durham and or Niagara Falls, or you're listening online into that you normally come to Toronto Church. We want to welcome you, and it'd be good to see you here sometime soon. But until we do that again, you're just going to be blessed as you go. Yes. <laughs> My goodness me. Yes. Come on. Yes. Come on down. The price is right. Yes. What is going on in the house today? Yes. What is going on in the house? Yes. That's the presence of God. I love it when Stella's mascara runs. <laughs> Everyone notices that, right? When that mascara runs. But guess what? We don't care. Right. Okay, worship. When you worship, when the presence of God comes, it gets messy. Look, read your Bible. It gets messy, it gets messy real quick. But we do not care. We don't. We do not care. We sang out with the Spirit, where you lead, I'll follow. Where you lead, I'll follow. Do you know what that means? That means tomorrow when, when God speaks to you about maybe paying $20 for a cup of coffee instead of $1.50, because God wants to bless the person who's serving you the coffee. You have to give them the 20 bucks. Where you lead, I'll follow. We can't sing it and not do it. That means next time you're in whatever store you're in to buy your groceries. Oh, hasho, if the Lord prompts you, if the Lord prompts you, buy the groceries. Don't question that. Because if you question it, you won't do it. Believe me. <laughs> if we question it, we won't. Where you lead, I'll follow. My goodness me. Man, breakthrough songs. Yes. Breakthrough. Yes. We go from a place of maybe kind of not feeling so great to a place of where we've just been, like we're just on top of the world. Yes. Yes. Where you, just, 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 in ter- just in terms of the songs of the Spirit, that second song, that second song was for me. Yes. There were some words in there that were just for me. I claimed it. You may have heard the song, but I grabbed it. It's mine. I just kind of grabbed hold of that. I'm thinking, yes, Lord, that's me. It spoke to me. Yes. Spoke to me directly. I love that. I love it when the Spirit of God does that. Yes. The Bible's real clear. It says that there's three, in all of the mess and in all of the world, three things will remain at the end. Faith, yes. hope, and love. Hallelujah. And they're good things. But then he says, but the greatest of these, the greatest of these is love. 
The greatest is love. And what greater love has mankind, and I challenge you to think about this, what greater love has mankind been shown than a father giving, giving us his son? If you've got kids, that resonates with you. If you've not got kids yet, it will resonate with you when you have those kids. There's no way, no way that you would give up a child. No way, all things being equal. And yet the father did that all those years ago as an act of love. As an act of love. And while we're, while we're praying, and while, sorry, while we were worshipping, I had this in my spirit to, to say this, that if you're feeling like an orphan today, if you're feeling like an orphan, then God wants to say, I am your father. Now, he's not saying, I am your father in Darth Vader kind of talk. <laughs> what he's saying is, listen, I want to be your father. So if you're feeling like an orphan, whether in here or whether online, if you're feeling like an orphan, God is saying, I, I am your father. So read the Bible. Okay, just going to get some books that's going to tell you about the love of God and the love of the Father. If you've never accepted Jesus before, know that Jesus came. It's the greatest love story in the history of the world. That he would do that. And it's real simple. All you need to do is believe that Jesus came. That he died and that he rose again. And that's it. And you accept that and you say it. And as soon as you do that, you're born again. Simple as... So if, you, you know, if that's you, just kind of like, you know, you've done that, maybe it's the first time a day, call the office, email, text, whatever you're going to do. Just get in touch with somebody who can support you on that, on that new journey. That's the love of the Father that we, we sang about today. That's why people start crying. Yes. Overwhelmed with love. Hallelujah. Now we have to show that love, right? Yes. How annoying is that? Yes. <laughs> We've been shown that love, but now we have to show the same love. We have to show the same love. Go to your Bibles to the book of James. James chapter 1. If you know that, if anybody tells you to go to the book of James, you have to prepare yourself on your journey that you will not get any sympathy. Go to the book of James. It's been a changing season. I want to talk about changing seasons today. It's been a testing time. It really has. It's been one of testing and one of trials. I want to speak about that today. Challenging times spiritually. And challenging times emotionally. They, they have been, so in James chapter 1, it says this. Dear brothers and sisters, who is writing to Christians, who is writing to you and me. When troubles of any kind come to you. So when troubles of any kind. So there's no way out of that. When troubles of any kind come to you, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, he says. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete and needing nothing. Other versions of the, of the same passage say, where it says, you know, troubles, it says trials. Now, trials by their very nature are testing times. Trials by their very nature are testing times. But I want to say this to you, I want to kind of put this out to you. Okay, that the, the, the test or the trial that we're going through is driving us towards something. So whatever test or trial that we're going through or we're experiencing in the past or even today is driving you and it's driving me towards something. But how we respond to the test and how we respond to the trials determine what direction we go in. Let me say that again. How we respond to the test and how we respond to the trial determines what direction we go in. And where we end up depends on us. <laughs> it doesn't really depend on God. It depends on, what, it depends on us. Where we end up depends on us. Many, 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 many years ago, I, I was working in America for, for about early 20s, for about five or six years. I used to work for the Boy Scouts of America. And I, was, I came from like an inner city, Manchester, in England, in England, and I worked over there. And I worked on the summer camps in, in upstate New York. And I did that for three or four years. And 
they, I worked at this camp where they, they put me in charge of the water, the water uh, sp uh, section. So I was teaching people canoeing and, and sailing and rowing. Now, there's barely any water in Manchester where I come from. <laughs> You know, so when, so when I'm being interviewed for the job, and it, well, actually, well, after I got the job, they, you know, they said to me, you know, you have to teach these kids how to sail. How to sail. And then they said to me, so, so they said, Steve, because they, they're in English, you think everybody sails, apparently. <laughs> so they say, Steve, you know, you know how to sail, right? <laughs> so I, was, I felt like saying, do I look like I know how I sail, how to sail? I had no clue how to sail, but guess what? You have to learn quick sometimes. Okay, you fake it till you make it when you've got the job. How many people can do that? Okay, a few of you, good. Fake it till you make it. So I'm there, so one thing that I'm talking about now about the direction we go, I'm talking about sailing. And one thing that I learned really quick, I learned this so quick, I learned this, that the only thing, the only thing that the sail does when you're on the lake is catch the wind. That's the only thing it does. What direction I go in depends on what I do with the sail. And once I start letting that sail out that's caught the wind, what direction I go in depends on what I do to steer the boat. The only thing, the only thing that the sail does is catch the wind. So if I can say this to you, trials and tests will come whether you like it or not. Boom. Boom. Test and a trial comes, sometimes unexpected. Not talking about just kind of recent stuff, I'm just talking about some things happen on a day to day basis that put you in a test and put you in a trial. So the wind can come and it's there. It's how you respond now once that test and once that trial has come. Because the book of James goes on to tell us what we say and how we act once we're in the trial will determine where we go. Yes. <laughs> He says, I mean, just for you, for you younger guys, what he says in the book of James is, is that your tongue, what? He says your tongue is like a rudder of a ship. No way. Yeah, that's why your parents are probably always on at you to say the right thing, say the right thing, say the right thing, say the right thing. Why? Because we know. We have experience. We know. We know that if you don't, it can lead you in the wrong direction and you can end up and then you get to the place where you are and you're like, how did I get here? Now God in his great and his mercy is going to get you back on track, but we don't want you to go there. So that's what it says. Amen. I wrote this down. There could be more. The psychology say there's around about five groups of people. I've narrowed it down to three when it comes down to kind of tests and trials. One group. The test comes along and it stops them dead in their tracks. The test will come along, the trial will come along and it stops them dead in their tracks. I was speaking to somebody earlier this week, a member of the family, and, and they were telling me, you know, and, and he leads, he's, an, he's a leader in a, in a big organisation and, and some, of the, some of the noises and some of the opinions and some of the research that's coming back is is that because of, the, of, because of the recent trials, because of what's happened over the six or seven months, there's people thinking about not going back to church. So these are real figures and real noises. So there's, so there's a group of people out there, a test has come and a trial has come. And what's he doing? He's stopping them right in their tracks because now they're thinking, well, I don't have to go to church anymore. Hey, listen. For anybody, for anybody who's kind of like done an ushering and, you know, and, you know, helped, you know in a ministry of helps, it's nice to be stay home during the week. <laughs> it's good not to come. Okay, but guess what? You stay home, you get into the habit of staying home. And sometimes it's nice to stay home, but we, we kind of want to meet. But you understand what I'm saying? We have, you know, we, we kind of over here, well, it's good to go, but it's also nice to stay home. I don't have to shower. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Right? But that's one group of people. The test comes and the trial comes and it stops people in the tracks. The second group. The second group I suggest to you, the test comes along and they get control of the boat. They get control of the boat, but, but, the boat, but in the process, they lose their compass. They lose which direction they're going. Yeah, they're kind of doing okay, but they kind of lost. 
They've lost the joy. They've kind of lost, they've, they've lost, you know, everything that was going well. They just, oh, well, well, I'm here. I'm still here. How are you doing? Well, it's just kind of okay. And then there's a third group. There's a third group. When that test comes along, I suggest to you that they manage the test. They manage it. They get hit with the test. They get hit with the trial, but they maintain control of what they say. And they maintain control of what they do. And they continue to head in the right direction. Heading in the right direction is really important. Really important. Now, there may be other groups. You may, I don't know what group you would put yourselves in. I don't know whether it'd be a group like this or the group outside of that, I don't know. But the important thing is, is that you don't let any test, any test or any trial di- di- divert you from the direction you're supposed to be going in. Amen. That's the message, really. Yes. A number of months ago, I was, I was really struggling, kind of like emotionally and, and, uh, and, 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 sp- and spiritually in some ways, you know, just kind of questioning stuff. Questioning myself and questioning kind of what was kind of going on and how I was responding to that. I know, and probably, you know, maybe some of you were doing the same. And then I woke up one morning. I woke up one morning and with, with this inside voice that said, Captain of, of your soul. It said, Captain of your soul. Now, what did I know about that? I knew that the, this this this. This uh, line came from a poem from Invictus. You may have heard of Invictus. You've heard of the Invictus Games run by Prince Harry. (laughs) But we'll move on from that. So anyway, so Captain of My Soul. It came from this poem called Invictus and it's Latin for unconquered. So I came downstairs maybe six o'clock in the morning with this thing, Captain of My Soul, kind of jumping around my spirit. So I I did what most people would do. You Googled it. So that's what we do, right? We Google stuff, right? So then I Googled it. It means, it means, you know, unconquered. I also knew this about it. That Mandela used to read it, it says, in his darker days while he was in prison. I'm a fan of Mandela. So my thought was, well, listen, if it's good enough for Mandela, it has to be good enough for me. <laughs> it's good enough for him. It kept him for all those dark days. I also knew this. I also discovered this. It's been said by some psychopaths who committed horrendous atrocities on their last day, before, just before they were leaving this earth after being, after being on death row. They would cite this verse just before they left this earth. It's a poem about self-sovereignty. It's about saying, listen, the guy who wrote it was an atheist and what he was saying was, listen, it doesn't matter if there's a God. You can, you can get through this life. You, you don't have to care about what, what's, what's before you or what's after you. The only thing that matters is you. So then I read that. I thought, well, I don't think that's what God was trying to get across to me when I woke up this morning with <laughs> captain of my soul. And then I discovered in the research that somebody had written a poem Years later, called Invictus Redeemed. I encourage you to go and read that poem. And what it does, it says that in, in, it puts all these verses together, and it's a response to that original atheistic poem. And it's a poem that says, In all these things, Jesus is the, is the captain of your soul. Amen. So there's a born again spirit. And then I read that and I had to weep. I'm like, so the message he was, he was trying to get across to me and the message I'm trying to get across to you is, is that no matter what the test, no matter what the trial, Jesus is the captain of your soul. Everyone go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, very familiar verse. I'll say this, and this is a hard thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because I know you guys are tough. He said, any test or trial... That drives us away from God. Our relationship with one another is not being handled correctly. Let me say it again. Any trial or test that drives you and me away from God and away from each other is not being handled correctly. Why? Because as it says in the, in the, in the earlier part of James, all trials are designed to bring us closer to God. 
That's what he said in the book of James. If you endure, if you stand the test, if you go through the trial, then he says what? I'm putting these things together. He says, listen, you will be complete by the end of it. Complete by the end of it. You're there in chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. This is, the, this is the message. Sorry, this is the title for the message. And the message is Jesus is not in the boat. Jesus is not in the boat. And as evening came, chapter 30, so Mark 4, chapter 35, I believe it is. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. And so they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although all the boats followed. But soon a first storm came up. You guys know this. High waves were breaking into the boat and he began to fill with the water. Next verse, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat on his head with a cushion. And the disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Now, some people say that Jesus was asleep. That he'd had a long day, hard day, and, you know, he's hot over there in the Middle East and he gets really hot and dusty and he's probably asleep. I suggest to you, yeah, it could have been. I also suggest to you that Jesus was giving you and I and the Christians an example of how we should be when faced with a test or a trial. Of how we should be when faced with a test or a trial. So when Jesus, so it also, excuse me, I also suggest, sorry, let me go to verse 39. And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the wave, silence and be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you have no faith? I love, the, I love the fact that Jesus answers the prayer first of all and then teaches on faith. Because he goes, now, now this is one for the younger people too or maybe kind of somebody who's kind of newly born again. Sometimes we have no clue what to pray. These guys didn't even pray. They just woke him up screaming. <laughs> they didn't say, oh Jesus, help us calm the storm. They just said, don't you care that we're, that we're going to drown? And what did Jesus do? Okay, and he calmed the storm. That was an answer to their prayer. Young people, it doesn't matter what you pray like. It doesn't, new Christians, it doesn't matter what you pray like. Now, the mature Christians, we have to grow. Our prayer life has to mature for sure. But when you're young, who cares? Just pray. Just talk to God. Amen. Scream at God. Lord God, what happened? These guys screamed at God. And he answered the prayer anyway. Why? Because he's so loving and he's so kind, that's why. I wrote this down. The disciples became fearful by what they heard and what they saw. The disciples became fearful, we know that, by what they heard and what they saw. Why? Because storms are loud. <laughs> they are very loud. Guess what? So are the voices in our heads. So, the voice, so the storms are loud, but so are the voices in our heads. And let me say this, so are the voices around you. So are the voices in this system around us. News media, this media, that media, they are very, very loud. How many of us would have responded, have responded like Jesus in your latest trial and in my latest trial? How many have responded like Jesus over the past six to eight months? Or how many have responded like the disciples? We need to get to that place where we respond to, like we did to Jesus. I wrote this down. If all around you is shaking, if all around you is shaking and unsure, and you are shaking and unsure, then Jesus is inviting you to step back onto the rock. Because if all around you is shaking, and all around you is fearful, and all around you is unsure, and you're those things, then we must have slipped back off the rock. Because when we put back on the rock, it's like, okay, this feels firm, this feels right. We had, I think I suggested you know, some of those songs that we sang today, they were grounding songs. When we worship where God said, listen, I'm your father, listen, I know to where my help comes from. 
Jesus is saying, come, come back on, come back over here. And Jesus is saying, I am not in the boat. I'm in you. In those times, when he's, when he's going crazy, he's saying, I'm not, don't look over here. I'm not in the boat. I'm inside you. The Bible is clear. That test and trials from the enemy's perspective now. The test and trials from the enemy's perspective are to dislodge. Yeah. Let me say that again. A test and trial from the enemy's perspective are to dislodge you and me from what God has said. And it is saying every week in these campuses that we have, Toronto, Durham and Niagara. Because the Bible's real clear. You, you, anybody who's kind of read the Bible just kind of just briefly will understand that. The devil's always trying to come along and say, did God really say that? Did he, did he really say that? Did he really say that? Any test or any trial, he's trying, what's God after? He's going after the Word. He's going after the Word that's on the inside of you. He's getting, he's getting you and me as Christians. This is what trials do from the enemy's perspective. He's getting, us to under, he's getting us dislodged from where we're supposed to be going. He's trying to distract us. We cannot allow tests and trials. We cannot allow tests and trials to devalue what God is seeking to do in your life. We cannot do it. We cannot allow it. We can't. We just, we just cannot allow it. I, 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 I had empathy just when we weren't allowed to come to church. And I know things have been relaxing different. You know, we're in you know, this Halton and Peel and different areas and so different areas have kind of different situations going on. And we just have to, you know, we have to abide by those things. That's what we have to do. But while we couldn't come here, I, I understood a little bit what it's like to live in a country that means you can't go to church at all. Because we weren't allowed to come. We were told to stay home. Now imagine, imagine that when the, when the doors are opened again. When the doors are opened again, we choose to stay home. I, I suggest to you that we, we have to be really careful with that. And I'm not saying, and I know that there's people within, within this earshot who have to stay home. We get it. Yes. You, know, you know, for all kinds of reasons. But we cannot allow the test or the trial to, to devalue the things that God has said over you. Yes. And God, that God is saying every week here in this place and other places. I'll finish with this in the book of Exodus chapter 13. The book of Exodus chapter 13 is a story of, of, the, of, the, of the nation of Israel being, being released from slavery by Egypt. So, you know, we've all seen, you know, we've all seen the movie where, you know, they, they let my people go and all that kind of stuff. And then, but the, the, the point I want to illustrate is that when, when God, when they, when they actually left, the promised land was over here. But God said in chapter 13, he said, I can't, I can't take you directly there. And I can't take you directly there because the Philistines are in the way. Now, who were the Philistines? Basically, they were the school bully. They get everywhere. They're really annoying. They just kind of like, they just, they just kill people. And they make, they make life for everybody else really difficult, especially, especially the nation of Israel. They keep on popping up and popping up and popping up. So God said, I can't, I can't, I can't take you this way. This is the way I want you to go. But I know that these guys are in the way. And the scripture tells us that. He said, and, 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 the, and I'm paraphrasing, but God said to him, he said, listen, if you go there, you will get killed and then you will want to go back to slavery. That's what he said in Exodus chapter 13. So, so my suggestion to you is that these guys over here were a test and a trial they were not ready for. These guys were a test and a trial the group were not ready for. But then about two months later or so in, in Exodus chapter 17, this other group of people come along. This other group of people come along. Now guess what? The nation of Israel is on their way to the promised land. That was not easy. There were people trying to prevent them from doing that. Just because you're a Christian, this, I think it's a great example of how the Christian life can be. It, guess what? It sucks at times. Because it can, it can be really hard. 
we have to battle. We have to fight. That's what the Bible says. We're in a battle and we have to fight. If that's news to you, you've not been coming to this church long enough. So, here, so here's the deal. So, they go, so, so it's, about two months, it's about two months later or so that in chapter 17, they come across another test and another trial for another group of people who want to kill them. But they were ready. They were ready for that. Why were they ready? Well, because God wouldn't allow it if they weren't. So they were ready, but two months before they weren't ready, but now two months after they were ready. You've got to have the singers and musicians come, please. So in verse 17, God knows that there was a test that was going to come along. Now, lots of things have happened in that two months. Lots of things have happened. Manna and quail, water from the rock, all these miracles, all these amazing things. I also suggest to you, two months, remember, two months, approximately. I said, what, they were, what the author went through, some spiritual and physical boot camp. Why? They left Egypt as weak slaves. They were treated terribly. They were barely fed. They were weak slaves when they left Egypt. But two months later, I suggest to you that they're ready. God thinks they're ready to take on the next test and the next trial and go to battle and win. In that two months, I suggest to you that physical and spiritual boot camp had prepared them for the test that they were going to face. So I suggest that whatever test or trial that you're in, whether you're in the room or you're listening to my voice right now, whatever test you're in right now, whatever trial you're facing, you develop a similar strategy. You develop a similar strategy. Go back. Build up your faith. Do some physical, spiritual boot camp. How many people have put on some pounds over this latest few months? Or is it just me? That's why you wear tweed. It covers everything. I'm told. So this is what we have to do. We have to develop our own plan. Develop a plan. Read some more books. Do what you need to do. Build yourself up physically. Build yourself up spiritually. Stay connected to people you need to stay connected with. Disconnect from the people you should not, be, should not be connected with. Why? Because the next trial is coming. <laughs> Why? Because the next trial is coming. What do I mean by that? What, let me just going to go back to 1 Timothy chapter 18. I love what Paul says to Timothy. He says this, just to finish. 1 Timothy chapter 18. Timothy, my son. Timothy, my son, who was going through a test and a trial as he was leading this church. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. And they are based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight the fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ. This is what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying what? Here are my instructions to you based on the prophetic words spoken to you. I know there's people in this room and people listening who God has used prophets to speak things into their life. I suggest to you and, and encourage you, go back and read those prophecies. They will ground you. Just like Timothy's doing, Paul, Paul's doing to Timothy. Go back and read those things. Go back and study those notes. That's going to build your faith. Why? Because the next test is coming. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, if you've not recovered from this latest test or this latest trial, you won't be ready for the next one. And the, and the, the bad news, good news, depending on how you want to look at it, is this. It's only going to get worse. <laughs> Great news. It's only going to get worse because Jesus said, listen, as, as, as the days shorten, there's going to be more and more tests and trials, more and more tests and trials. And yet, oh, hallelujah. What you and I do as born again, men and women, children of God, we rise up. We rise up. We rise up strong and we say, hey, listen, this is the way we deal with our business. This is the way. 
And then when we lift him up, when we lift up the name of Jesus as we sang this morning, then people can say, what is going on with you guys? You crazy people, what's going on with that? And we can say, well, guess what? The club is open, it's accepting membership. Amen? Singers and musicians.